Hello and welcome to Pods Above Replacement, part of the Padres Hot Tub Podcast Network. My name is Rafi Cantor. I am the producer of Padres Hot Tub and joining me from the Mile High City, he's taking a solo flight to South Korea. It's John Fricota! I, I hear people are really swaggy over there. They're always dressing good. So I got my brown hoodie on. You got your brown hoodie on. You're ready to go to Seoul too. Yeah, is is that a Tatis reference? Because I believe that's mm-hmm. what he was quoted as saying. Uh, something something along the lines of, "What do you think of Korea?" And he was like, "Everyone dresses swaggy over here." <laughs> like, <laughs> He's giving us the insider information. So like. uh, I've never related to anyone more of, of being put on the spot. Uh, John, it's good to see you. Uh, we uh, Pods of Replacement has awoken from its periodic slumber to do this. Um, so we'll be jumping in to do shows when possible between now and, and the end of June. I know, uh, for me, that is a, a busy period in my life. Um, I am currently working as, uh, the writer's assistant on the TV show Poker Face, uh, on Peacock. Uh, so we are a Peacock household now. Friendship has been ended with Netflix. Uh, <laughs> we are only a Peacock house. And, uh, John, I'm wondering what's, uh, what's new in your life? Oh, nothing. It's been a it's been a long off season. I do not blame Par for this. I blame AJ Preller for this. If he wants to give us some content, then he can give us some content, and we'll come on. Um, but no, June's probably going to be a very busy time for me too. That is when residencies start. So we're both going to be busy in June, but hopefully we can crank out some material. Padres are actually doing some stuff now, so that'll be interesting. And yes. we're back. We're back, baby. We're back because on uh, Wednesday evening, uh, I-, I was I, basically on the on Pod's, uh, Padres Hot Tub, I was saying for weeks how I had given up hope. And um, I had forsaken AJ Preller. I had taken him for granted. Uh, I should know better at this point that anything can happen at any time. Um, being a Padres fan is uh, receiving a lesson in chaos theory. Uh, and, um, so, uh, from out of nowhere, we received news that the, the, J- the Jeff Passan tweet hit like a lightning bolt that the Padres would be receiving right-hander Dylan Cease from the Chicago White Sox in a trade. Um, and so the Padres got Dylan Cease straight up and returning back to Chicago was, uh, pitching prospects Drew Thorpe and Jairo Iriarte. Outfielder Sammy Zavala and relief pitcher Steven Wilson. So before we break down the specifics, John, what was your initial thought when you heard that return? Well, well if you remember, the, the return kind of came out came out in waves. So it was like Iriarte and Thorpe for Cease, and I was like, oh man, what a great trade. And then Steven Wilson got added to the trade. I thought that was a weird addition. Like, I don't know why the White Sox were so keen on Steven Wilson, but whatever. And then at that point, it's kind of like, you know, that that uh simpsons episode where he's like chasing the pig and he goes like it's a little slimy it's still good it's still good and he keeps chasing the pig all the way down until it flies into the river <laughs> that was that was me at that point i was like oh okay this is a little bit it's a little bit worse but it's still good it's still good and then they added Samuels of all i was like okay it's still good it's still good and then it stopped there so i, I it stopped still in a like that was a painful price but it's still good type spot and so i'm happy with that yeah, I mean, again, any good compromise is where both people leave a little bit unhappy. Um, and I think that that was the feeling that I had, certainly, uh, with the trade is, you know, when I saw that we traded for Dylan Cease, I was like, okay, cool. This is something, uh, this is a move that needed to be made. I'm glad that we made it. And I saw the price and I was like, yeah, that stings a little bit, but also that's what Dylan Cease costs. So, you yeah. know, it's like, okay, cool. Let's Let's move on from there. Um, so as always, when, when these trades happen, uh, we like to take the analytical approach and break down just how these teams came to the decisions that they came to, uh, and, uh, what those, this trade is basically worth in terms of present and future war. So, um, we've talked uh, multiple times on the show about the idea of present day war and, and, uh, that's, you can go to fan graphs, you can read a lot about it. 
there. Um, but essentially, you know, when you're talking about a trade like this, where you're trying to value prospects who are not going to contribute immediately uh, versus a, a star or, or any present day player in the MLB who's going to contribute now immediately and provide you value now, how do you value those two things? Um, because A, prospects are a bit of a mystery. We don't know what they're going to provide per se. Uh, you know, they could be good. They could be shit. We don't know. Um, and then uh, also they're going to be providing value in the future, which is not now. And so typically, if you're getting war now, you're going to pay a little bit of a premium on it because you get the luxury of getting that now when you need it, as opposed to maybe getting it down the road. So um, we're using Fangraph Zips projections for all of these uh, numbers that we're going to throw your way. But this is the present day war breakdown. Um, of this trade. So Dylan Cease in 2024, this coming season, is projected to put up 3.4 war. In 2025, in which he will also be under Padres team control, he's projected to put up 3.1 war. However, because that production is going to be coming a year from now, it gets discounted at about 8%. Um, the specifics of that, I'm not going to bore you with, but just I'm just going to put a big old trust me stamp on there and just say it's coming in the future it's a little less valuable so um that means that you know at an eight percent discount he's actually going to be putting up 2.9 present war if that makes sense so so uh adding up this year and and next year in present war terms that's 6.3 present war john that's a lot of war don't you think that is a lot of war, and honestly, it's less less war than he's put up over the past three years. And the, I mean, they tend to discount those because they're you know injuries, attrition, those things happen. But I mean, if that's your you know median outcome is you know over three over three war for two straight years, that's a lot of war. That's a valuable player. Yeah, it's just a reminder that Dylan Cease is a dude. You know what I mean? And it's like I think you know he's been playing in the AL Central we haven't been that exposed to him I know we got that one matchup with him last season where we, where we really got to see him strut his stuff and I think he kind of exposed us in a way and uh, uh but you know people in the American League who have really been dealing with him a lot are, are, are always effusive in their praise of him and it's just really cool to see the numbers bear that out that like this is a guy who is going to be an impact player for the Padres going forward uh, going back to Chicago, okay, again, we talked about future war, we talked about present war. Um, so, according to Fangraphs, Drew Thorpe and Jairo Iriarte are both 50 future value pitchers. Um, I, I mention Fangraphs particularly for Iriarte because they're about the only ones who have him ranked that highly. Um, but Eric Loggenhagen, who runs uh, Prospect Evaluation at Fangraphs, he is someone who's been, again, effusive in his praise of higher Iriarte and thinks he has a, a lot of upside. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, but what a 50 future value pitcher equates to, uh, you know, in terms of average outcome for uh, four players is, is 2.3 present war per 50 future value player. And I think that that is uh, really indicative of a... The, the wide range of outcomes that pitching prospects have. Because remember, at any moment, a pitching prospect can explode. Like, they can just explode into smithereens, elbow blows out, they're done. There's a huge amount of risk that's involved in, uh, in taking on a pitching prospect. And so that's why you see, like, guys who, when you're, when you're ranked, uh, you know, 50 future value, uh, essentially what the evaluator is saying is that they think you can contribute to war a season. And uh, these are guys that are going to be under team control for six years. And so for guys who are going to be under team control for six years and have the capability of contributing to war a season to still only be worth on average 2.3 present day war, like just shows you how big of a range of outcomes they can have. So Thorpe and Iriarte, each worth 2.3 war. That's 4.6 total. Zavala, you know, kind of the converse of uh the Iriarte uh Fangraphs is pretty low on Sammy Zavala there are a lot of uh evaluators that put him as a 45 I think I've even seen a 50 somewhere before in the past uh in terms of future value for Sammy Zavala you know assuming 
you know, they, they like his hit tool. They don't know if he's going to be able to field in center field. Um, he made improvements last year, but Fangraphs has him as a 40 plus and a 40 plus uh, position player only is worth 0.4 present day war. Again, showing the myriad range of outcomes there. Zavala is still a teenager. Like anything can happen at this point. This is a dude who could be a contributor every day at the major league level, or he could not make it past double A. And so there's, they're really just kind of playing with that range of outcomes. Steven Wilson, finally to round this out, also worth 0.4 war. I think for us, we have a emotional attachment to Steven Wilson, you know, our favorite Uber driver. He has a great story. <laughs> um, he's made market improvements under um, uh, Ruben Niebla as, as pitching coach and, and really, you know, taking that sweeper and elevating it. But I was looking at his projections and I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, he's like a sixth inning reliever. And that's what people like, like kind of think he is. And, you know, he's basically expected to put up 0.2 or 0.1 war over uh, each of the next three seasons. So. Rounding that all up, 5.4 present day war going back to Chicago. Uh, so on the present day war side of things, before we get into the money, um, you know, advantage Padres, 6.3 versus 5.4. We'll take the extra win, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, we'll take the extra win. And, and, and I mean, it's also solving a, you know, a problem. So you're also like filling a hole, which makes it potentially even worth more than that to our team. Because, you know, the, the likelihood of us trotting out like whoever the Ryan Weathers, the Rich Hill or whatever of this year is goes, you know, markedly down. And Dylan Cease versus whoever our fifth and sixth pitcher were likely to be is a market improvement. Yeah. So uh, now let's talk about money, because um, that's really the the main other core of this trade. So. We spent all season talking about how the Potters are broke again. Um, and that they can't <laughs> afford to spend any money. They, they slashed almost a hundred million dollars in payroll, which is still unfathomable to me when I say that out loud. Um, and this is a small improvement going back in the opposite direction. Um, the Padres we knew going into this trade had about $20 million or so to play with, uh, to get, uh, to still remain under the competitive balance tax threshold for this season. Um, Again, they're they're repeat offenders, so it's it's actually quite imperative for them to get under. Um, just from a you know, if you're gonna have AJ Preller as your GM and you're gonna want to let him cook and and be able to pick <laughs> up prospects, you want to give him the ability to to get as many guys as he can. And you know, with the penalties, you know, often have draft implications, international bonus money implications, et cetera, for for being repeat offenders. So um, I think it's actually a good thing for the team to get back under this year. Dylan Cease is going to be paid eight million dollars this year. And $12 million approximately, let's just say next year, based off of his current ARB numbers. So over the next two years, that's going to cost the Padres $20 million uh, to bring in Dylan Cease. Now, of course, going back in the other direction, uh, the White Sox are going to be paying basically nothing to everyone that they get back. Um, uh, you know, Thorpe, Iriarte, Zavala, these are guys who are going to be paid the league minimum salary the next, you know, three seasons, you know, if they make the team. Um, Zavala, you know, I only counted him as costing the White Sox $0.75 million, $750,000, because he's not expected to land on a big league roster until 2026. So, um, whereas Thorpe and Iriarte, I think are, I would say, especially in Chicago now, I would say more likely than not to both contribute to that team this season. Um, and then Wilson, you know, he's getting paid the minimum salary this year. He's ARB eligible next year relievers are going to get you know million bucks million and five in their first year of our you know go up a little bit from there uh so uh i estimated 9.1 million dollars that the the white Sox are going to have to pay over the next three seasons for these guys so um let's put this all together because the padres you know again 6.3 present day war coming back if we're uh, valuing that at nine million dollars per win that's $56.7 million in value that they picked up in this trade, and it's going to cost them $20 million. So in terms of surplus value, they raked in $36.7 million in surplus value. The White Sox, with their 5.4 present day war, uh, are getting $48.6 million in, in value from this trade, but it's only costing them $9.1 million. So this is where we have a slight advantage for Chicago. They're getting $39.5 million in surplus 
value production, um, whereas the Padres are only getting $36.7 million. It's pretty much even. Um, you know, it's not a huge advantage. I think it's pretty negligible. Um, and uh, again, it's that you, if anything, you can chalk it up to, like you said, John, the Padres are feeling a need. They're getting the production now. It makes all the sense in the world, even if you have to take a little bit of a surplus value hit to make this trade. Um, and, I, and I love doing this math. And this is something that you had commented on before we hopped on, where it's like you do the math and you're like, oh, this is pretty even. This is how these trades are made. You know, it's like it, it's not an accident that, you know, Dylan Lesko or Robbie Snelling are not in this trade, you know, uh, because I think the Padres probably see those guys as 55 future value, you know, in the case of Lesko, potentially even a 60 future value if you're using the AJ Preller tools school of evaluation. And so they weren't going to give those guys up. And so it's really awesome to see you know how the, how this works out john of um this being kind of even on paper yeah i mean it it, it looks like it, it was an even trade we we kept the guys that we probably rated a little bit higher in lesko and snelling those were probably i would imagine that they probably asked about lesko and snelling and we tried to pivot to thorpe and iriarte i mean thorpe in particular to me i thought that it was a strange trade acquisition for aj preller because he is a little bit of a boring high floor maybe not the highest ceiling kind of guy and then it's not surprising to me that we immediately didn't value him as much and probably like wanted to him to be the you know part of this package when viewed as like worth about a 50 about a 50 future value player because he he did have the lower ceiling and I, I was I was happy about AJ Preller kind of pivoting against his true nature but it's funny that he couldn't stick to that for very long yeah yeah exactly um and it, it's interesting there's a bit of competing narratives in terms of like when it comes to Thorpe, usually when you see a prospect traded <laughs> multiple times, that's a comment on that prospect that like maybe these teams don't necessarily believe in him, even though the evaluators say that they like him. Um, I I would I think Drew Thorpe is going to be a, a big league contributor. Um, you know, wh whatever that upside is, that remains a question. But I you know I could easily see him being a four or five starter on a team in the future, regardless of of how many times he's been traded. And I think it's, I think context is important. He was traded for Juan Soto and then he was traded <laughs> for Dylan Cease. These are like, yeah. these are guys, these are, these are, these are huge major league contributors. And I think it's, it's um, not a mystery that teams want Drew Thorpe back in return. Um, so I, I don't think this is any sort of value judgment on Drew Thorpe. I think he's going to, and this is probably good for him in his career uh, trajectory, because he's going to, like I said, he's going to, but the, the Chicago's gonna have him pitch in Chicago this year, and you know he might not have gotten that chance in uh, San Diego, depending on how things worked out. So um, that being said, let's get to know Dylan Cease a little bit. Uh, December twenty eighth, nineteen ninety five is the birthday. Um, younger than both of us, John, uh, which that's is that's upsetting. Uh, a little bit upsetting. Um, and he's like a major league veteran, you know. He's not even like a young guy. He's like an he's a vet. Pitcher. <laughs> capital yuck. v yuck um 2014 june amateur draft taken in the sixth round by the chicago cubs actually not the chicago white house the chicago cubs drafted out of high school um he was taken in a draft class that also featured kyle schwarber justin Steele, um padres legend james norwood uh so uh you know that that theo epstein guy knew what he was doing i guess uh turns out newsflash um, and he ended up on the south side of Chicago because he was part of a, a trade in July of 2017 that I had forgotten about until we were researching the show. Um, Dylan sees part of a, a White Sox package that included Eloy Jimenez, Matt Rose, and Brian Fleet, Flete, Flete, I don't know, um, <laughs> going to the, to the south side in return for Jose Quintana. Um, so that is a, a trait that like almost deserves its own podcast, <laughs> I'm sure, like, you know, uh, Chicago, you know, whatever, Lake Michigan cold plunge is doing their own, uh, mm -hmm. podcast version of, 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 uh, of, of that trade talk. But, um, anyway, all that's to say White Sox got Dylan Cease, uh, in this trade and he got off to a slow start. Uh, you know, played in 2019 and 2020, 
put up a combined about 130 innings in those two years and, and had a combined ERA um, of around five between 2019 and 2020. Uh, so we're, you know, kind of, okay, the cease kid maybe isn't going to work out. We'll see. 2021 has its breakout year. 165 two-thirds innings. 12.28 Ks per nine, which, John, I'm told that is a lot. Um, <laughs> that is a and, lot. And, uh, you know, his walks per nine, kind of getting up there. 3.69 walks per nine. Um, and all, all, all that's to say, you know, equaled out to a 3.91 ERA, but more importantly, 3.41 FIP, um, which contributed to 4.5 WAR 2021 season. Uh, 2022 is is the year that made Dylan Cease into into who he is. Uh, you know, 184 innings, 11.1 Ks per nine, which is still great. Uh, 3.82 walks per nine. You know, so that's that starting to become a little bit more of a feature in his career that he's he's walking a lot of guys. Um, but some incredible strikeouts plus some good batted ball luck contributed to him putting up a 2.20 ERA, uh, a 3.10 FIP, 4.4 F4 that season. Um, and uh, 2023, just to, to, to kind of round out this conversation, on paper, if you just look at that ERA number, you might think, oh, this guy really took a step back, 4.58 ERA. Um, but his 2023 season wasn't all of that different from 2022 when he had this like amazing, amazing year. Uh, from, from a strikeout standpoint, 11.1 uh, strikeouts per nine in 2022, 10.9 in 2023. From a walk standpoint, 3.8 walks per nine in 2022, 4.0 in 2023. Home runs per nine, a really, really good 0 0.78 in 2022, and also good. 0 0.97 in 2023. The difference, the difference between his, you know, second place Cy Young year in 2022 and last year, which people kind of were questioning whether or, or not he was still that guy. BAPIP, which we have, we, we have established, is, is basically a, a luck stat. Um, in 2022, he had a 260 BAPIP, which was the 13th best in the league for qualified starters. And in 2023, he had a 330 BAPIP, which is the worst, the worst in the league last year for qualified starters. So a combination of poor batted ball luck and also poor defense in Chicago uh, contributed to the, those BAPIP numbers. And finally, you know, this is kind of a, a correlated stat with BAPIP, but his left on base percentage, this is something we talked about a lot with Blake Snell last year because Blake Snell, it's like, how did this guy who walks so many, you know, uh, hitters like end up winning the Cy Young and he was, the strikeouts are so high, but the walks are so high, et cetera, et cetera. Well, he like basically left the world on base the entire time he was on it. And <laughs> yeah. in, his in his 2022 season, uh, Dylan Cease wasn't all that different. He had an 82.3% left on base percentage. That was fifth in the league. Uh, for qualified starters. And again, last year, 69.4% left on base. That was the eighth worst uh, in terms of qualified starters. So you look at the difference between those two seasons in which his ERA in 2023 was literally more than double his ERA in 2022. And yet on paper, Fangraphs has his 2023 campaign being worth 3.7 F war versus 2022 4.4 F4. So really not all that different between those two seasons. John, I'm curious, between all these stats, who do you think the real Dylan Cease is? I mean, I think he's somewhere in the middle. Are, are we talking about like, what do I expect him to be on the Padres? What, what do I expect him to have done on the White Sox? What would I expect him to be in a context neutral team? Because the teams are wildly different. Like, if you go from 2021 through 2023, like to put a capper on just how big of a difference the defenses are, in those three years, San Diego has been third in the league in outs above average with 66 outs saved. That's like 66 runs saved, maybe even like right around 60 probably runs saved. And the White Sox in those three years are 26th in the league with negative 45 outs above average. So that's like a, what, 111 outs difference through those three years, that's a huge difference. So you could expect, if anything, for that BABIP to be better on the Padres than it was on the White Sox, and probably closer to that 
2022 year, which like him having that low of a BABIP with that defense is just remarkable, to be honest. But I would expect it to be closer to that number than it was last year with his terrible defense, you know. And so I think that when he goes to a better ballpark to pit in which to pitch, two, he has a better defense behind him. We'll see if he has a good bullpen that's able to, you know, close down any runners left on base. And you put those together, they're definitely going to be better scenarios than they were on the White Sox. I would expect his numbers or his ex- his regular numbers to come closer to his expected numbers. And his expected numbers have always been very, very, very good. So, John, uh, not only is he going to be playing in a different ballpark, uh, playing on a different team, he's also going to be playing with a different pitching coach in Ruben Niebla. And Ruben Niebla is someone who we've already seen leave a mark on some of our pitchers. And I'm curious how you think uh, Ruben Niebla and Dylan Cease working together may evolve going forward and how you think we can see Dylan Cease changing. Yeah, so, I mean, I I am very, very excited about Dylan Cease. Uh, there's, there's a lot of people who are maybe a little bit lower because of his probably mostly just the 4.58 ERA that he had last year. I am a huge Dylan Cease fan. One of the reasons is because he's already good. So like his floor is very, very high. He's in the last three years been the eighth best pitcher in terms of F4. I mean, the eighth best pitcher in the game over three years is already a very, very good pitcher. And, you know, we're going to get at least that, I think, in his age 28 and 29 years. So right in the prime of his career, a pitcher who has been the last three years, the eighth best pitcher. Wow, that's already like a very, very good addition to your team. But I also like pitchers who have a clear flaw because you can always make moderate improvements, even if it's just tiny improvements on whatever's your clear flaw, that's going to help you be a better pitcher. And so I think that his ceiling is even higher than it already has been, which is like one of the best pitchers in the game. And one of the reasons why is because like you were talking about that walk rate and how Ruben Niebla could put potentially help fix that. And I mean, one of the reasons why he has a walk rate that's so high is because he's really reliant on a slider, which is a great pitch, but not a pitch that he commonly keeps inside of the zone. And so I I put up his little Plinko, which is like what pitches he throws by uh, like the count when he's throwing them. And you'll see that he has to rely on his slider a lot, even in scenarios when he's behind in the count or when the count is zero zero. And if you can't trust that pitch to get in the zone, then you're going to fall behind a lot. And when he falls behind, it's very, very similar to Blake Snell. When he falls behind and he no longer has the ability to throw his slider and not have the batter know whether it's going to be in the zone or not, when you can just spit on that, his numbers change dramatically. So when he's, so just let's just go with the first pitch of the, of the bat. When he is 0 and 1 on a hitter and afterwards, his ex FIP from that pitch on is 252. But when he falls behind on that first pitch, suddenly it goes to 565, which you could say, yeah, obviously it's worse to fall behind in the count, but most pitchers aren't like that. Most pitchers don't fall like three runs of difference. For example, Joe Musgrove, his goes over the course of his career from 283 to 484 when he misses in the on the first pitch. So this is a guy who needs to get ahead in the count and one thing that Joe Musgrove in particular, who I just compared him to, got much better at is having pitchers that he pitches that he could throw in the zone early in the count and potentially get ahead in the count. That's one of the things that made him much better when he came to the Padres. Right away, Rothschild worked on a cutter for him that he could put in the zone. And then Niebla has incrementally increased his changeup, which he can put in the zone early in the count. And so just to put some numbers on that, the past three years, his changeup usage have gone from 4.3% to 6.8% to now 11.4% last year. And then before he was a Padre, his cutter rate was 6.4%, and now it's up to like about 20%. And so Musgrove basically added two pitches that he can put in the zone. They're not his best pitches, but they're pitches that could go in the zone and get him ahead in the count, and then he can get to his nasty breaking pitches. And Dylan Cease kind of needs to do that same thing, because if he's behind in the count, he's much, much worse. So he's a guy with good spin rates, so he could add a cutter like Musgrove. He could increase his changeup usage, which Niebla loves the changeup, so I would almost expect that to happen. I would say we we got him onto our team so late in this offseason 
that it probably reduces the likelihood of them being able to work on that pitch shape quite as much as Niebla would probably want to. But we've seen Niebla make midseason like changes. We saw that with Stephen Wilson, for example, where he changed from a slider to a sweeper right in the middle of the season. So I wouldn't be surprised if eventually he starts increasing that change of usage, hopefully increases the shape or improves the shape on it a little bit. And then he could also add a sweeper potentially with how good his slider is. A sweeper, it's a pitch that you can normally get into the zone a little bit better. So if he does, so he has like already that's three options of something that he could do to just improve the rate at which he is ahead in the count. And when he is ahead in the count, he has two of the nastiest pitches in the league, quite frankly, his slider and his four-seam fastball. And if you are behind in the count against Dylan Cease, you don't know whether a very nasty fastball is coming or he's breaking off a slider off of that nasty fastball. You're just, you're scared, right? You're just, you're, there's a very good chance that you're going to strike out. And that explains his incredibly high strikeout rates. Yeah. So, um, you know, you're talking about someone who has struck out a lot of hitters, walks a lot of hitters, is dominant, uh, but also has some kind of wild and varying stats from year to year. Boy, does that sound familiar to uh, Padres fans and to baseball fans at large, because that sounds a lot like Blake Snell. And so, you know, I wasn't the first person to say this when we we did our reaction show on Wednesday. There have been, you know, a lot of na- baseball writers who've been talking about Dylan Cease is like a right-handed Blake Snell. And I was, you know, okay, he, you know, strikes out a lot, walks a lot, you know, okay, like, cool. But I was like, just how similar are these guys? And I was able to go th- on fan graphs and I was able to search basically all the way back to 1969, which is not only the year that the Padres entered Major League Baseball, but it's also the year after Bob Gibson's 1968, you know, world beating year where basically they lowered the mound from 15 inches to, I believe, 10 inches. And it basically started the modern pitching era with with the with the lower mound. And I was curious how many starting pitchers have uh, a K per nine career above 10, 10 strikeouts per nine innings and a walk rate of four walks per nine uh, for their career. And so again, th- I'm going to repeat those metrics again, starting pitchers with 10 strikeouts per nine innings and four walks per nine innings or more in their career. And there are only two pitchers in <laughs> baseball since 1969 Which are they? <laughs> who have those statistics. And it's Blake Snell and it's Dylan Cease. To be specific, Blake Snell has 11.1 Ks per nine in his career and 4.1 walks per nine. Dylan Cease, 10.8 Ks per nine and 4.0 walks per nine. That's it. Those are the only guys. And I set the innings threshold at 200 innings, which is like a, yeah. a se- I mean, back then it was a season, and now it's a little bit more than one season of baseball. And, it, you know, Dylan Cease has thrown 650 career innings. Blake Snell has thrown almost 1,000. And still, even with the threshold that low, it's only those two guys. And it's like, not only do I find that remarkable, just from like a pure, you know, these are these are pretty you know, basic statistics and, and still it's only these two guys that are, that are there, but also because, um, I, I think I'm just kind of shocked at like how few guys in the league walk and strike out those, those many guys. It's like, there, there's a, there's a reason why there's only two, why it's, why, why it's a group of two. It's because <laughs> you can't survive in the major leagues. If you're walking four guys per nine innings as a starting pitcher, unless you're striking out 10 guys per nine innings. And so I, I think it just speaks to the skill of both of these guys, just how nasty their stuff is. And like you're yeah. saying, John, like I, I, I'm so intrigued by this prospect of an evolving Dylan Cease because it could mean that he gets even better. He gets even better than his current form. Um, and so I really like this idea of another pitch for Dylan Cease. I'm curious, do you think that that pitch is going to be a changeup? I, I think that I would be shocked if his changeup usage does not increase. I, he already has a changeup, so working on that's pretty easy. You're just, I mean, one, tell him to use it more, and two, just make sure that the shape looks good. I, Niebla has proven to be a, someone who likes to improve or increase changeup usage. I, I personally, if you think about him getting a at least 
major league average changeup against lefties and then having that nasty slider against righties. Like I, I would be shocked if Niebla doesn't think of that as a as a great idea for him going forward. Like I said, it is it is late in spring, so it'll probably be incremental improvement month by month, but I would be shocked if that's not an option. But with his spin rates, like adding a cutter would also be pretty simple, I would I would assume. And just seeing if he could land that in the zone on a zero zero count once in a while and then working towards increasing that if it works, I could see that too. So I, I, I would be surprised if at least a changeup doesn't happen. But over these two years, I'd be surprised if a changeup and another pitch doesn't come up. Yeah. So um, just looking at his arsenal, we've talked about the slider already. Um, he technically has four pitches. He really only throws three of them, though. Uh, he throws a four seamer and a slider about as much as, you know, the other day. They, they both get about 40% of play depending on the year. So that's 80% of pitches right there. He throws a knuckle curve as his third pitch, which he throws 15% of the time. So, I mean, it's not a pitch he's relying on a ton. It's basically just to keep, you know, hitters honest between those other two pitches. And then, like you mentioned, John, he does have a changeup. But the changeup, he's only thrown for either 2.4 or 3% of the time in the last few years. So it, it's there in the sense that it exists, um, but it, it's not really a pitch that he throws frequently. And so I, I think like you're saying, John, like if he just ups the usage in that arsenal for something he can throw more consistently for strikes, I think he's going to have some great, great results. Now, I do want to start lasering in a little bit more on that slider. Um, because we've talked about, okay, he throws a slider and it's a good slider. Like, I don't think we've talked about just how effing good this slider is. So I'm going to throw up some, some photos on screen right now. Again, we hope you're watching us on YouTube, uh, you know, by, by this point, because if you, if you're not, you will have missed some visuals that we've already put up, but now we're going to start throwing some, some <laughs> graphics up and also some, some game footage as well. Uh, so you can see and the who slider doesn't like slider action. porn. Everybody loves exactly. slider porn. Slider porn, exactly. That is the name of our new ska band. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk about 2022, which again was his, his world eating year. Um, in terms of sliders, Dylan Cease had um, the best slider in 2022, and it like wasn't even close. I it was almost twice as valuable as the next best slider. The next best slider was Edwin Diaz, by the way, in his great year that got him his, you know, $100 million contract. And uh, then the next after that was Andres Munoz, Max Scherzer, Camilo Duvall, and Shane Bieber. All right. These are all studs of the game. And none of them were even close to uh, his 36 run value slider, which is just unbelievable. And if you want to think, okay, that's a slider. That's one pitch. How does that stack up? Well, in 2022, it was the most valuable pitch in baseball, according to run value. Okay. Um, the next closest pitch was Shea. She uh, you, ever, you ever heard of this guy, Shohei Otani? Um, <laughs> yeah, this is the first time saying his name. Could, we couldn't <laughs> even get the name out. Shohei Otani's sweeper, Justin Verlander's four seam fastball. Sandy Alcantara's changeup and Carlos Rodon's fastball in 2022 all paled in comparison in terms of run value to Dylan Cease's slider. So um, it, it, it's a, a phenomenal pitch. You know, last year, obviously, it wasn't quite as good as it was in 2022, but, um, you know, I think was still in, you know, top 30 run value uh, across the league in terms of pitches. And John, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about why it was just so valuable. Yeah, so his slider, uh, obviously, like you just you just put forward that it's just a dominant pitch overall, and he uses it a lot. And you know, one of the problems is whether he can get ahead in the count with it because it does break off the plate a lot. But he did lose last year a little bit of the horizontal movement on it, on it, which made it a little bit of a worse pitch. Stuff plus had it drop from a one thirty six, which is obviously incredibly fantastic, to a one twenty, which is still very good, but not you know thirty six run value type good. And then the x wob on it dropped from 201 to 273, so it was a little bit worse pitch. He also had about a one-mile-an-hour drop on both his four-seam fastball and his slider, which, I mean, the shapes were still good, especially on the fastball. The shape was just as good as before. But when you drop a mile per hour on your pitch, the results tend to be worse. I, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, he's three straight years of having about 180 innings per year. 
So there could be some signs of wear on that. Luckily we have that pitch lab, so hopefully we'll be keeping him in good shape and hopefully getting that mile an hour back, maybe even, you know, getting further than he was in 2020 too. So, I mean, his stuff plus is just so nasty. His, even his just pitching plus overall, obviously his location is not as good. So it drops his pitching plus, but he's just really, really good. His, his slider is amazing. His four seamer is amazing. We'll see what we can do with the, with the change up with the knuckle curve. He does usually only use the knuckle curve as kind of a get me over pitch. You can see in the Plinko from before that it's very common on a zero zero count just to try to steal a strike. But it's it's not a pitch that he probably has as much confidence in. So getting like I said, getting ahead in the count for Dylan Cease, very, very important because then he has two just disgusting pitches. Like in terms of baseball in general, the only real pitcher with two like a fastball as dominant as his and a breaking ball as dominant as his consistently over the past three years is basically Garrett Cole. And I mean, even Spencer Strider, who you think of as just having two dominant pitches, his slider is not anywhere near as dominant as Dylan Cease's, at least in court, terms of stuff plus. So, I mean, this is in terms of stuff plus the past three years, the fifth best pitcher in the game, right behind Corbin Burns, Spencer Strider, Garrett Cole, and Shohei, pretty good names to be compared to. And then in pitching plus 17th in the game, right be- between Evaldi and Otani. So we're talking about an incredible addition. I mean, arguably immediately slots into our ace, but you could argue, at least in terms of the past three years, that Cease, Darvish, and Musgrove are very similar in terms of their their value, although most metrics would say that Cease has been the most valuable. So just a, just a very, very great addition. Do you have anything to add on his repertoire before I go into one last thing on, on Dylan Cease? Um. Nothing on his repertoire, and I and I think I know what you're about to transition to, and I, I just want to say, like, I spent a good five minutes talking about how he's right-handed Blake Snell, and I think you're about to tell me why he's not right-handed Blake Snell. Um, so please, after I built all of that up about how he's right-handed Blake Snell, tell me why I'm wrong. <laughs> I, I'm not telling you you're wrong. You put up a, a data point that is the most similar picture since 1969 but i will say here is one important (laughs) part in which he is not like blake snell that i think that we will all find to be much less frustrating because walks are frustrating inherently but blake snell's manner in which he walked folks where he would like draw up the pitch count so high and like never make it past the fifth inning or seldom make it past the fifth inning was very frustrating it was a frustrating watch i don't think dylan cease is going to be as frustrating of a watch and one of the reasons why we, we talked on a recent par episode about getting through the lineup a third time and how valuable it is to have a pitcher who gets through the lineup a third time. And Dylan Cease is literally one of the best pitchers in the game at getting through the lineup a third time. Over the past three years, he is 10th in Xwoba the third time through a lineup, right be- between Corbin Burns and Aaron Nola, who are pitchers that you think of as guys who put up great numbers for long periods of time. And Blake Snell, in comparison, out of the 48 pitchers that I had listed on my thing, because I put in a qualifying of at least uh, 1,500 pitches, that brought up 48 pitchers, and he, Blake Snell was 36th on that list with a 340 X Woba. Dylan Ceases is a 301. So now, I, I said on that former episode that Darvish and Musgrove have proven for a long time that they are capable pitchers of going a third time through the order. Blake Snell is almost the opposite. He is not a pitcher who's proven good at going through the lineup a third time. And now we have three pitchers that can do that. We have one pitcher who has to prove that he could do that in Michael King. And if he doesn't prove that he can do it, we can give him a lot of help with getting good middle relievers in right behind him in like the fifth, sixth inning so that his numbers look good. And he has, you know, uh, an ability to slowly work his way up to seeing if he can get through a third time rather than being forced into it and, you know, Hopefully this works out. If it doesn't, we're just kind of screwed. But it makes me real comfortable to know that we have three guys now who are three horses who all expect, barring injury, to give you a lot of innings and go through the lineup, you know, three times successfully, which saves the bullpen for those other two games or three games in which maybe you have a pitcher who has good stuff, but maybe not the longevity of these three guys. So you can use everybody in a manner that is best suited to their strengths. You know, if we have Brito go through two times through an order and then put in a middle reliever, if we have Michael King do the same thing, if Vasquez has to get some opportunities, we do that with him. 
We can use Waldron in shorter spans, like I think that you and I, in terms of Waldron Cauldron, thought process are both more in line with him being a one-time-through-the-order kind of guy, where he can mess people up with the with the knuckleball a couple times a week rather than just once, and then have somebody either follow him or be preceded by him that's wildly different in terms of their rep- repertoire. I, I like this ad for how our team is constituted going forward, and in a way that I did not like Blake Snell quite as much. Oh, uh, hang on. I, I have stuff I want to <laughs> rap with, but I want to hear that part of it. Why, why do you like this more than when we got Blake Snell? Well, because, okay, Blake Snell, what are his drawing points? I, I love Blake Snell as a pitcher. He is a very nasty pitcher. It makes it such that he converts into a very good playoff pitcher, at least on paper. For us, he was, you know, just okay in the playoffs. But you have a guy with dominant stuff who can narrow it down to very dominant pitches when he comes to the playoffs. But what Cease offers that, that Blake Snell, Snell does not offer is an expectation of longevity during the regular season and an ability to convert into a very nasty pitcher in the playoffs. Where when he's going down to that fastball slider, if, if you're talking about just an expectation of five, six innings from Dylan Cease, they're going to be some wicked five to six innings You know when he's throwing as hard as he can. Whereas Blake Snell was already throwing as hard as he could. He is a guy whose stuff noticeably fell off in terms of like the quality of the stuff after about the fourth inning. That's why in the World Series that one year, he was taken out in like the fifth inning when he had, you know, given up no runs to the Dodgers and everybody freaked out. It's because if you were the Rays, you were seeing the quality of his pitches fall off as the game goes on. And you don't want to keep that guy in, you know, whereas Dylan Cease is going to have the same fastball in the fifth, sixth inning that he had in the first and second inning. And that is a very valuable thing, both in the regular season and then converting into the playoffs. Makes a lot of sense to me, John. And I think I, it's worth just kind of wrapping on this note of, of what this means for the Padres, just in a, a kind of a holistic sense. And uh, Eno Saris put out an article this week that was really like um, glowing, I think, in terms of like this trade making sense for the Padres as, as a thing to do. Um, which is interesting because it's like uh, the athletic guys, uh, you know, Saris and Keith Law were both like, this is a no brainer for the Padres. And the fan graphs side of things were kind of like, I don't really get this as much for the Padres, <laughs> um, just in terms of like, why trade away Juan Soto and then, you know, turn around and then trade for make a trade for deal. It's like, it's just completely different principles in terms of like, are you joint, doing a soft rebuild? Or are you not like whatever? Um, and uh, in Saris's kind of again uh, praise piece, he talked about a couple of things. One, our front four stacking up with any of the front four in baseball, basically. Um, you know, I'm going to put up a graphic right now that uh, that Saris created in terms of stuff plus and location plus for our front four starters, which is stuff that you were just talking about with Cease. Um, he has us ranked fourth in that metric. Um, you know, just behind the Orioles, just ahead of the Astros. Um, you know, so it goes Dodgers, Mariners, Orioles, Padres, and Astros in terms of stuff plus and location plus for the front four. And then if you kind of zoom out a little bit in terms of the top 10 rotations in baseball, um, ranked based off of projected F war, um, the Padres are lining up sixth in baseball out of the top 10 for rotations. Um, and that's behind the Dodgers, Phillies, Braves, which I think in any top three, you can kind of take their you know, you can take their rotation in any order, and I think you can make an argument for any of them being the best one. Um, and then Mariners, Twins, Padres. Uh, and I think that they're they're very clearly the next kind of like second tier below that. Um, and yeah, I, I really think the discrepancy between us and those, you know, top top tier Dodgers, Phillies, Braves teams is that our fifth starter is some replacement player essentially it's some amalgamation of yeah. brito waldron vasquez you know maybe avila i don't know who knows after the spring if we're going to see him this year um and uh so whereas these other teams all have a guy who are is their fifth yeah. starter who's going to put up a win or a win and a half or something like that in that place and that gets them over the edge so um you know i think in the shit storm of last season and the the unclutch, unlucky sequencing of everything, uh, it's easy to forget that the starting rotation was really good. Um, and I think one of the things I was worried about 
coming into this season was, okay, we're going to get some regression offensively in terms of our clutch stats, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but at the same time, uh, our pitching is going to take a step back. And so it might not be there to receive that, that regression that the offense is also going to get, and it might cancel each other out. Now I'm not as worried about that because now we have like a real deal rotation. And uh, so if we get any sort of regression in the offensive stats, like I think we are going to see the benefit of that. So um, I don't know. I'm, I'm now, ex- Craig said this on the main show, but like I, I'm now excited again for Padres baseball in a way that I wasn't. Um, so uh, any parting thoughts about this whole thing, John? So, sometimes I get a little bit of a negative Nancy look on moves when I look into the numbers. Like I really did not like the Wandy Peralta deal, for example. I will say that this one has my stamp of approval. I really think it makes the team much better this year. If the goal is to be a potential playoff team, which I think it should be every year, I think that we have the core of players to be in that playoff race for each of the next two seasons. And really the question comes down to, is this finally the year that AJ supplements the team in some manner or another with depth. And so far he hasn't done that. And I don't know whether rookies are going to be able to come up and provide that say mid season, but we have less depth than we did obviously a few days ago. And it's, it's this I, in isolation. I love this trade. I think that this one, like we got the value that we needed in terms of the people that we gave up. I think that it solves problems for us that we very specifically had and makes like Schilt's job a lot easier in terms of like squeezing the most juice out of out of the rotation. And I'm a little bit nervous that like we're all happy, you know, go lucky in June or July because our team is outperforming expectations. And then what happens after that? I mean, it does give us an opportunity with the extra money that we have to like supplement our team in terms of trades. And I think that we probably will have to do that. So hopefully there's some rookies or some uh, prospects that pop. Like usually that happens. Usually like a you know estuary Ruiz pops that we weren't even thinking about before the before the start of the season. But when somebody gets hot this this year in the in our prospect rankings, just kind of expect them to be traded. I feel like they probably will be that that like high riser, and then that's probably how we're gonna have to solve our depth. Hopefully it works. It'll probably be expensive. We we keep paying with the credit card. That being said, I appreciate this deal. I think it's a really well done deal. Well, we have nothing to worry about because, as we know, uh, AJ Preller batting a thousand at the deadline in terms of trades, he's never. Made. <laughs> uh, so we'll just, I'm... <laughs> we're just gonna put just put back up that same episode from last year on his deadline deals and just like yep. add ten minutes of how bad Rich Hill was. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, with like the Benny Hill theme song, like just playing. Over it. Uh, <laughs> Okay, John. Well, this was fun. We got to talk about a good player who's new to the team. We haven't been able to do that in a while. Uh, so this has been another episode of Pods of Replacement. Um, you know, we will, like we said, you know, be hopping in when we can during the season. Uh, we have, we'll have much more to discuss, obviously. Uh, and until then, uh, for John Prakota, I'm Rafi Cantor. We'll see you next time.